Hey, great to be with you this morning. And uh, uh, again, as we are experiencing life in the new normal of live stream and an empty room. And uh, I, I, I mentioned this last week, but my, my microphone cable was, was messing up. Um, it's difficult uh, f- to sing to an empty room and to preach to, different, to an empty room. And so one of the great things that would help us out on the live stream is if you would post um, and, and statements of encouragement as we go back and look at it later on, we can see the folks that are that are participating and are engaged in the live stream. Uh, a couple other things as well is um, we also, during this time, we're not collecting an offering here at the church, and I've been asked to put this out, that if you would like to uh, bring your offering either by the church office uh, during the week, that's fine, or if you need somebody to come get it, just let the church office know. Um, and so we can uh, take care of those matters as well. Uh, but uh, would like to welcome you to the worship service this morning. Let me open up the worship service with a word of prayer, and then the praise team will, will take us out for that. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to come to the homes of uh, many folks that are watching the, by the live stream. We ask, Father, that uh, uh, they are edified, even though we as the body are not physically meeting here in the church, we are still the body of Christ. And we ask that during this time of worship that Uh, those who are watching at home will be actively engaging their faith through the music and through the hearing of God's word. We ask for your blessing upon us in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It 
never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails and never gives up, never runs out on me. It's your love. On and on. And on and on and on and on it goes. It overwhelms and satisfies my soul. the 
one who gave it all and I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am is yours so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe at the one who gave it all I'll stand my soul Lord to you surrendered all I am is yours so I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all and I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. And all I am is yours. All I am is yours. And so I am is yours. Breath. 
We thank you for everything you do in our lives, Lord. We thank you for this time of um, we thank you this time of fellowship, Lord. We pray for peace as we go throughout our week with this um, epidemic, Lord. And we, we come to you. We thank you for everything you do. We pray for Brother Ashley as he's about to give us your word, Lord. We pray that you'll speak through him in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Hopefully you all said good morning at home because I can't hear you and I turned my live stream off. So it's great to be in the house of the Lord, even though uh, you are in your living room. And this continues to emphasize the, the understanding that the church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. And while the body cannot corporately be together physically here, it can be corporately together online in the service. Uh, just a quick note, I posted my slides uh, for this sermon to Facebook a little bit after the, uh, the uh, rehearsal. It's in a video format. The only way to get PowerPoint onto video is to turn it into a video. So um, there is no audio. I tried to get James Earl Jones, but after the last Star Wars, he's done with voiceovers. Because uh, they totally ruined that whole series. Uh, so I tried to get him to do the narration, and he said no. So there is no volume. You should be laughing. Um, and um, but um, So during the sermon, as we're going along, you will have to pause it, or it will move ahead of where I'm at, and then we'll all be lost and totally confused. So uh, we're trying something new to where you hopefully can follow along uh, with me at home. So we're looking at Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. And one of the things that happens in Titus, especially in verse 11, is um, we make a hard break here. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we are driven by tradition in many ways. We, we all approach the text from a certain traditional standpoint. And we make a hard break in Titus chapter 2, 11, even though there isn't a break. And you got to remember, if you were with us last week, the context of Titus chapter 2 is that you are to teach what accords with sound doctrine. Now, he's going to close out to, that, to, to continue on in proclaiming these things. And so there are brackets that tells you that what's between those two brackets, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 15, are a connected thought. And so last week we looked at the responsibility and the understanding of sound doctrine that older men have the obligation to train, to teach that which accords to sound doctrine. And, and he gives specifics for what older men are to do and that they have an obligation to model that behavior for younger men. Older women are to teach and train younger women how to, how to, do, uh, how to love their husbands and to do good things. And that good things isn't to turn them to Sally Homemaker. It's to understand their role uh, as a wife and a, and a young woman in the godly world under, uh, under the guise of sound doctrine. And then we have slaves being mentioned that by sound doctrine, slaves, you're not supposed to steal from your employer. You are not supposed to quarrel with your employer. And the reason being for that is in the church at that time, you may have had masters and slaves of the same household going to church as equals as the member of the body of Christ, but yet socially not equals in their status. And the slave is not to use the position of the equality in the house of God to be quarrelsome or argumentative with their master. And we'll see later on um, as we continue to walk through the text that, that we, we move away from this understanding of, of people owning folks because you're owning the the, uh, the image bearer of God. But that's the implication of why bonds are to way, live the way they are. And then we make a shift, but that's typically not a shift. 
And the reason why I say that is because our tradition tells us to shift. And we're going to look at that. We're going to look at two types of traditions and how to understand Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and following, and how from a certain tradition you are going to read it with one set of lenses and how from another tradition you're going to read it with another set of lenses. And this is where tradition runs into an objective standard. And how then do you use the objective standard of God's word and why it's important to, to look at verses within their context. And so we're going to begin by starting off by reading all of the verses. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us in to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, waiting for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people, his own possession, who are zealous for good works, declare, uh, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no one disregard you. So there's the, the rest of that passage. And notice you see it in verse 15. These things are to be declared. Well, what things? Well, you have to go back to how it's predicated. These things are to be done through sound teaching and doctrine which accords with sound teaching. And so you have this predication of that. And you also are to declare older men have a responsibility to train younger men. Older women have a responsibility to train younger women. Slaves have an obligation to live in a certain way. And then we have this section, and it seems like an interruption. Okay, and so we'll, we'll move on. So you, I've discussed that already. Uh, well, you're not seeing my slides. You should be following along. There should be a slide that says Titus 2, 1 and Titus 2, 15. That's your bookends. And that tells you that everything in this chapter has one relatable point. They have a context. He set the context. Sound doctrine and living and proclaiming sound doctrine. So what then are the two traditions? Well, there's technically three uh, one of them would be if you're from a free will camp, you're going to read this text differently than if you were from a more reform camp. Or the third one, which we won't really cover, I'll address it just shortly here, is a, is a camp called Molinism. Molinism is very popular with certain philosophers. Um, it breaks down eventually in certain understandings, and I don't want to really chase that rabbit. So we're going to look at the two positions. One of them is the free will position that all men mean all men, and all always means all. Well, the problem with that is even in the pastoral epistles, if you were with us for 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul makes a statement that all in Asia have abandoned him or the gospel. Well, now, if all means all, that means every single individual from where those churches were in Asia to Japan up to the Russians, all the way through India and Pakistan and all that. Well, and you go, well, no, what he really means is all in Asia Minor. Okay, that didn't help you. You just limited the all to all in Asia Minor. Well, that means that every single person in Asia Minor, because if all means all, every single person in Asia Minor heard the gospel, believed the gospel, accepted the gospel, and then abandoned the gospel. Well, that's not what Paul's talking about there. He is talking about all of the church in Asia Minor have abandoned. And so he's using all as not an extant, but as a select. And so this is how Paul uses all in a lot of cases. Now, one way to look at this, and that's from the free will, that all always means all. From the Reformed tradition, we would look at this and say, well, that what all means is all classes of men. And we're going to look at the three big verses that usually come along when you hear this, because here also boils down how we approach context. The free will position will run to not just Titus 2.11, but will then jump to 1 Timothy 2 and 2 Peter 3, and they will build a context for Titus 2 based upon those other two passages. The reform position will go to the context of each one of those verses and address the verse in that context. And then you look outside. Why is that? Because Titus 2.11 is written in the center of a chapter that is addressing sound doctrine. It has a context in the chapter it's in. It also has a context to the hearers that are getting it, the folks at Crete. 
It then has a context within its subset of the pastoral epistles. It then has its context in all of Paul's other epistles. It then has a context within the New Testament writings themselves, and then has a context in the text as an overall approach. And so here's the thing. You must start with its first context, which is in the chapter 10. Then you can go outside and look. But if you skip the first step, and just go to the secondary step, then you're going to run into issues by reading context in. And this is where tradition blinds us to what we're doing. If your first step was to go John 3, 16, 1 Timothy 2, 2 Peter 3, then you are applying a traditional context to the verse instead of the textual context to the verse. So let's look at these. Let's look at some of these, and I mentioned them. I'm not going to cover every verse that deals in this category because we would be here for much longer and you would eventually turn it off and then beat all the methods to the white meat since you were eating at home. So, I mentioned three verses. I mentioned 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4, and this is typically how we apply the context uh, if you're from the more uh, uh, all means all camp, or the, uh, and I'm from the more reform camp uh, of the all classes of people. This is how you would how you would assign the context for Titus chapter 2 11. It is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. See here in 2 Timothy all means all therefore in Titus all means all there's your context. Okay so that's this is how you apply the context. Also in 2 Peter 3 9 the Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promises some count slowness but is patient towards you not wishing that any should perish, that should reach repentance. See, again, all mean God wants all to reach repentance. And so what you've done is you've chopped out and you've gone to these three verses to supply the context to understand Titus 2.11. Great. Problem. Did you bother to look at the context of 1 Timothy 2? No. How about the context of 2 Peter 3? No. Why not? Well, because if I looked at those, well, those verses have a different meaning in that context. Those verses actually address something slightly different than, than, than passages of salvation. I know they're used for salvation verses, but they're more for another understanding. And we'll look at that here in a moment. So let's look over at 1 Timothy 2.4. 1 Timothy 2.4. First of all, then, I urge supplications and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving now. What's the immediate context? Prayer, supplication, intercession, thanksgiving. That's the context. I urge these things to be made for all peoples, for kings, for all in high positions, that they may leave peaceful and quiet and godly and uh, uh, that they may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified. It is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. The context of the reason why it is pleasing for those to come to salvation is predicated in the prayer. I am to pray for people not that they become good moral creatures. I am to pray for them so that they may know salvation. I am to pray for leaders not to, and, and let's use it pull it forward in our modern day. You, you may be a, a never-Trumper. You may be a pro-Trumper. You may be a mega person. You may not be a mega person. I don't pray for Donald Trump to where he can be a good man. I pray for Donald Trump that if he is not saved, that he becomes a godly man. I don't pray for Chuck Schumer so that he doesn't take away my guns. I pray for Chuck Schumer so that he may become a godly man. See, the predication for the salvation is that we are to be praying for these individuals. We are to give intercession for these individuals. We are to give supplication for these individuals so that they may not simply be good people, morally distinct people, but that they are to be godly people. And the implication is that the prayer that we do is not simply for them to just simply be moral creatures. Because again, morality detached from the text is going to be determined by a subjective standard. So secondly, look at this. He starts off with a very broad, for all people, and then he begins to get specific at who he's talking about. Types of folks, kings, those in high places. 
Individuals of leadership. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, and we'll see this more in Titus 11, most of Christianity was very popular amongst the slave class. And I don't want to tip away too much in, in second, over in Titus, but much of Christianity in the first century world was very popular amongst the slave class. Still much to that today. Those who are typically in the lower rung of life typically gravitate towards Christianity. You really see folks that move into the upper echelon of economics really kind of move away from that. And, and, and the reason being is, well, they begin to trust in their own, in their own arm, in their own bank account. Uh, and I used to see this when I worked in the inner city. Yeah, I used to, I used to go to church, but now that I've grown up, I, I, I really don't think church is for me anymore. So it's for little kids, and it's for the poor, and it's for the slave class. And here Paul is saying, listen, not only is it for the slave class, but it's also for rulers. It's also for those in high places. So it's really not talking about salvation coming to all people, but the prayer that we are to give is that those individuals that we are praying for, that salvation come to them. All types, all classes of people. So let's continue on. So let's look at 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9. Uh, now, if you're looking at the slides, if you see dot, 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 and if you don't know, that means that certain passages have been cut out. I have the text pulled up for me. I can read it all the way from the beginning, uh, but we'll roll forward with this. Now, this is the second letter that I am writing to you. Now, here's the immediate context. Beloved. So who's he writing to? He's writing to believers. Matter of fact, beloved will appear again. So this is the second letter I've written to you, beloved. Remember... First of all, that scoffers will come. So the context here is that scoffers are coming and they are going to mock the church. This is a church that's struggling with the fact that God has, you have these conversations about the Lord returning soon. You have the uh, passages or, or, or teachings that said, I come like a thief in the night. No one knows the hour and the day. And so Jesus has been resurrected and it's been a bit. And the early church struggled with this. The church in Jerusalem really assumed a lot of times that Christ's return was imminent in their lifetime. Unfortunately, they, Christ's return has not happened even for us yet. And so they had an understanding that Christ's return was coming very soon. And this is the same context here in 2 Peter. And so the understanding is that they've either missed the resurrection or the resurrection isn't coming. And they've been duped. And so Peter is going to give them assurance. Scoffers are going to come following their own sinful desire, saying, where is the promise of his coming? It's been a long time. Christ hasn't come back. You clearly are believing in the wrong thing. God isn't, God's left you. You literally have been left behind. For they deliberately overlooked this fact. What's the fact? That the earth at one time was destroyed by the hand of God and now has been set up and stored up for fire kept until the final day of judgment. What you are going to see here in 2 Peter 3 is the, what we would call here in, the, in a little bit in Titus 2, the second epiphany, the second coming of our Lord. All of this is referencing the second return of God. In the same way, the heavens and earth are, now exist are stored up for fire, kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not, so they've overlooked this fact, do not overlook this fact, that the day, to the Lord a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow in fulfilling his promises, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing any should perish, that, and that all should reach repentance. The all is the referent to the brethren. Brethren, I don't want you to be lost on this fact. Do not overlook this fact. If you are still here, then the, then the Lord has not returned. If you are still here, you have not missed the resurrection. Why? Because God is not willing that any that are his be lost that have not reached repentance. This passage is about the assurance of salvation, that you, if you have salvation, if you are his, then you know that there is a future coming when the Lord is going to come and judge the scoffers. Notice it doesn't say that salvation comes for the scoffer, but comes to judge the scoffer, destroy the earth, but those that are his are going to be brought to full repentance in the coming day that when, when Christ comes. Why? Because he is not slow in his 
fulfillment of promises, but is patient towards you that any should not perish. That's the context of the passage. So how do you then read Titus 2.1? And again, this is again more from a Reformed tradition. If you're more free will, you can say, well, I don't agree with you. That's fine. You could choose not to agree with me. I think you have the greater burden of proof because you have to pull the verse out of its context. But that's fine. You can choose not to agree with me. That's okay. Titus 2, 1 through 10. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men, older women, younger men, older, sorry, older women, younger men, bond servants, masters. Masters is implied because if you have a bond servant, if you have a slave, you must have a master. The, also, the implication is Jew and Gentile. So that everything may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for. Now, the context is all the people in the chapter being addressed. Older men, older women, younger women, younger men, masters, slaves, Jew, Gentile. Types and classes of people. Pull that forward with that as understood in First Timothy. And you have kings, paupers. People in high places, people in lowly estate. Not simply a religion of the slave. Not simply a religion of the masses. You see this as an accusation given out a lot of times um, by, by especially communist or socialistic leaders. I'm going to read to you a quote from uh, Karl Marx. If you've got the slide, you can read along with me. Religion is the sigh of an oppressed culture, the heart of a heartless world. Just as it is the spirit of spiritless situation, it is the opium of the people. The abolishment of religion as an illusion of happiness uh, of the people is required for their real happiness. Just a side note, this comes right out of communist and socialistic doctrine. So for those of you that want to gravitate to the communist socialistic doctrine of the world, you are in direct opposition to that of Christianity because these are godless philosophies and this is not. But if you notice what he said, religion is the opiate of the deceived masses. And one of the argumentations is that Christianity is simply a, 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 a religion for the poor, for the oppressed, for those without hope, for those without any understanding, for those, without, for those that are not, not educated enough. And you really see this in our modern culture. You, you'll see one of the great accusations leveled at Christians, and some of them have come out this week, that Christians vote the way they do because they are anti-science, they are anti-intellectual, they don't believe in higher learning or higher criticism they they really are kind of well they're they're you know y'all are just sacrificators and what paul is arguing is this is not simply a religion of the slave this is not simply the religion of certain demographic groups it's not a religion of the jew this is a religion for all men and women older men older women younger men younger women free slave jew gentile Man, woman, children. That's the classes and types of people. That's how a, a, a Reformed tradition would read these passages. That's how I understand them to be taken. You can say, well, I don't agree with you. Okay, some people think ta uh, tomatoes go good with chicken. So let's continue on with what Titus really is talking about in Titus chapter 2. Because Titus is not talking about just salvation. He's talking about two events in time. One has occurred, one will occur. That's the purpose of sound doctrine and wise there. Titus chapter 2, look at what it says. The first epiphany. Where do you get the word epiphany? That word appeared in Greek is the word epiphany. For the grace of God has appeared. This is really the force of what's being going on here. In the first epiphany, God comes and brings salvation. How? Well, if you look at how the verse is written, the grace of God. Grace now takes on a personified role. Grace is going to bring salvation. Grace is going to teach. Grace is going to do these things. I'm getting ahead of my slide. That's okay. And the second epiphany is we are waiting for the blessed hope. Notice that word, the appearing. A future epiphany. 
in which the glory of the great Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will present itself. The full glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will come. So the context of this section of this passage is the reason why sound doctrine is important is so that you understand the first epiphany, that Christ has come, that Christ has died, that Christ has risen, and salvation has come. The second epiphany, we are waiting for the blessed hope of the return of Christ. That's really the context of the passage. It isn't a primarily a salvific passage. It's more of the understanding of the two timelines of epiphany, and we'll talk about that. For the grace of God has appeared. Again, grace is taking on a personified role. Why? Because it's grace bringing salvation. You say, great, for those, uh, and here's the thing, for all people. If you're going to take the all means all, you have a, uh, a, an issue in the fact that this lends itself towards universalism, or in the, the new theology is open theism. You go, oh no, the all who choose Christ. Okay, now notice what you did with your tradition. You had to add those words. To mitigate universalism, you had to add the words for those who choose. Those words aren't in the text. So if you take the passage in its context, grace brings salvation to every person on the earth. There is no choosing there. You have to add that. Your tradition dictates you add that there. See, this is where when we read through the lens of tradition, we add to the text unknowingly adding there. You say, well, I think you added when you say all classes of people. I think I can go back and show old women, old men, young women, young men, free, slave, master, bondservant, Jew, Gentile. I think I can demonstrate those as classes of people. Kings, poverty, those in high positions, those not. Those are classes. I didn't read that in there. That's there. So you have an issue with context. You have to add that. So if you go with the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, you're tracking toward. This is where universalists, these verses that I quoted, the reason why I quoted them is these are the stalwarts of universalists. They run to these verses to prove universal salvation. Now both the free will camp and the reform camp would reject that. But you have to add passage, words to these passages to make your theology work. I don't. Bringing salvation. Now, the personified grace is bringing salvation. It's bringing salvation to all people. It's also training. Now he gives the all people an identifier. Training us. The all people are identified in the us. He's bringing salvation to all people, training us. The all people is the us. Well, who are the us? Well, now here's the thing. If the us are not the regenerated, then that means that all people can renounce ungodliness and world passions. Not without salvation. Not without grace bringing salvation. And the us, the training of us, how do you know how to renounce ungodliness, divorce from sound doctrine? How do you know how to live controlled lives outside of doctrine that accords with sound teaching? How do you know how to live a godly life that renounces all the worldly things of the world, divorced from sound doctrine? How do you, how do you get there? Well, you can do theistic Christian moralism, which basically tells you that you can live a moralistic life following the principles of Jesus Christ, but you don't really have to embrace Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. You can uh, uh, approach this from Aristotelian virtue theory, and you can be a virtuous person. But even in all of that, still, none of that saves. All of that is just the works of men. How then do you understand the, how to renounce ungodliness? Because grace, which is bringing salvation, is training us to renounce these things. Did you catch that? Well, what is grace? Well, if grace was favor for all, that would how you would have to read grace and salvation for all, grace is favor for all, then you get all people are saved. If you look at grace as what it means, which is unmerited favor, favor that I don't merit, something done for me that I can't do for me, something that God has done. Notice it's the grace of God. So God's grace, which is done for me in a way that I can't do for myself, that grace brings salvation. That grace then trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. How do you know what a worldly passion is? Divorced from sound doctrine. How do you know what worldly activities are? 
divorced from sound doctrine. Well, I know the Ten Commandments, and that's all I need to know. That's great. The Ten Commandments are, 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 are good things to live by. But if you go over and read what Christ says about certain things in the Ten Commandments, sound doctrine teaches us that it's not simply the physical act of murdering an individual. Christ ratchets it up and says, if you thought it in your head about murdering an individual, you're, you're just as guilty as murdering someone. And so our lives, ungoverned by sound doctrine, how do you know? How to renounce ungodly living. Secondly, as believers, we are to renounce ungodly living. How do you know what ungodly living looks like? Well, I had this set of rules when I got saved. I was given this set of rules. I don't smoke, I don't dip, I don't chew, and I don't date girls that do. I don't go to movies, I don't play games with cards, and I don't roll dice. I, I don't listen to certain music upon the radio. I don't drink, I don't, and I've listed that one twice there, but some, for that's a big hang-up for a lot of folks. Um, I don't watch the Star Wars series because they ruined it all. I don't continue on with whatever you want to do. Well, those are cool rules. True cool story, bro, it changed my life. But none of that makes one saved. It's the grace of God that has appeared, that has brought salvation to all, free and slave, man and woman, rich and poor, young and old, alike. And it is training us to renounce ungodliness, training us to renounce worldly passions, training us to run from those things. But as a matter of fact, this is the very first nature of repentance. You're headed towards worldly passions. You're headed towards ungodliness. And the grace of God that is training us, trains us to renounce us, to turn and walk away from them. And so another way that you can put it in there is you put the word repentance in there. To live, now we are to denounce those, but when we turn, we are to live self-controlled and upright lives and godly lives. How can you live a self-controlled, upright life if you're not governed by the original context of this passage, which means teach things that accord with sound doctrine. So you cannot run away from the overarching context of this passage, which is the teaching of sound doctrine. And this is where we must understand the second half of chapter 2. How do you live a controlled and upright life? Christian, you can't guess at it. And you can't be governed by, well, I think this is sinful. How do you know it's sinful? Well, it just feels sinful to me. What is the standard you use to teach people to live a self-controlled and upright life? The standard is the objective standard of God's Word. We say, well, we come at it from different traditions. You're right, we do. And that's why it's good to have two traditions that, uh, that, that work together and worship together. Why? Because both traditions will push against to help us see the filters that we may be reading text with. You know, well, you have a tradition that you're reading through. You're right, I have a Reformed tradition that I'm reading through. I'm fully aware that it's a Reformed tradition that I'm reading through, and I'm fully aware of the free will tradition that I read the text through. Why? I used to be one. And now I have shifted over to a more of a reform position. Why? Because when I read the text, I see a reform lens. You say, well, I don't. Okay, great. Go and be blessed by God. Move out and draw fire. But the objective standard of God's word is to help us in our understanding of how to live a controlled, upright, and godly lives. It teaches us not simply rules to follow but how to develop and understand a Christian ethic. See, a lot of us do not realize that even as Christians, we live with a worldview that is worldly. We live in a worldview. And you'll see this, especially as Christians work in the business world. They are more apt to embrace a world business model than they will a Christian business model. And you say, is there a difference? I would contend that there is. I used to see this when I was a chaplain in the Army. I would sit and talk and be in a meeting with the staff and talking to the colonel and briefing the colonel, and you would, you would get into this concept of ethics versus legality. And I've had some commanders uh, say, well, you know, I'm really not concerned about the ethics of the issue. I just want to know if it's legal. Okay, the minute he moved that direction, what he embraced was a worldly worldview. Because a worldly worldview is only concerned of the legalities of an action. A Christian worldview is concerned about the Christian ethics 
of an action. And a lot of times we as Christians think as long as it's legal, it's moral. The problem with that is that we are murdering children at an ungodly rate, and it is legal, but it is not godly. We are embracing all forms of sexual immorality in our culture where we now have individuals who claim that they do not know the gender that they are born with, even with a mirror. A Christian worldview says there's two genders because God makes two genders. A, Christian, a worldly worldview that says marriage between whomever and whatever is fine. A Christian worldview that says marriage between a husband and a wife is the prescribed model. This is a Christian worldview. This is a worldly worldview. And a lot of times Christians have embraced this. One, because they work in a world that embraces this. And if they don't want to lose their job, they have to acquiesce here. And the fact of the matter is, Christians, you are to be governed by a Christian world view that the salvation that comes is to train you to renounce this and embrace this. Why? Because I say so? No, because the text says so. Because the purpose and the thrust of the text constantly talks about obedience to that of Christ. John Murray writes a book called In the Schoolhouse of Obedience. And I've been reading that because that's one of my, my COVID-19 sequester books that I'm reading. This is a very small pamphlet if you want to go look at it. And it's a great book. He's talking about the purpose of the Christian life is to be in obedient to the things of God. And we go, yes, I'm obedient, but I'm still wanting to embrace this worldview. Can't do it. You cannot have this worldview and try to be in this worldview. You are now have... For life's in conflict. And so my encouragement to you as believers is start to look at the worldview that you possess and ask yourself, do I live by the governing factor of it's legal? Or do I live by the governing factor of, well, everyone else is doing it. Do I live by the governing factor of, if I say something, I will lose my job? And here's the thing. Look at what a Christian worldview presents. Why? Because we are to live upright and godly. How? In this present age. In this age. Does that mean that we won't sin? No, it's not saying that at all. Does that mean that we won't live, behave in an ungodly manner? Nope, that doesn't mean that at all. It just means that the purpose of this epiphany is for us to live lives that are controlled and upright and godly in this present age. Does not mean that we won't sin. Doesn't mean that we won't have problems. Doesn't mean that we won't have issues. Now, in this second epiphany, that changes. And so we'll take a look at that now. The second epiphany. Waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing, that's what epiphany means, the appearing, when, what, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The second epiphany we look forward to with hope. See, what should govern the Christian life, even during this time of this scary virus, we as Christians are actually to live our life totally other than the rest of the world. We are to live a life without fear of these things. Why? Because we have a hope that the pagan does not have. We have a blessed hope that the world, the individual, does not possess. They do not have this hope. They will not have this hope unless, of course, grace comes and brings them salvation and then they begin to be taught to renounce those things of the world. We have a blessed hope. But even if we survive this pandemic, and uh, we still have the blessed hope because the appearing of our Lord and Savior is to come. This second epiphany is the context of 2 Peter 3. What Peter is addressing in 2 Peter 3 is what Paul is addressing here in the second epiphany. And so you have to read those passages in the context of this understanding of the second epiphany, of the blessed hope, of the appearing of our great Lord and Savior, who gave himself and redeemed us from all lawlessness. Now here's the thing. Gave himself for us is not us universal. This is us, the body of Christ. Why? This is his second coming. This is his second return. This is his returning to judge the wicked and those who are condemned and to bring those who are his to himself. Why? Because he redeems us from all lawlessness. In his second epiphany, the final redemption of man 
comes and we no longer in the second epiphany will commit acts of sin. In the first one, yep. We fall in sin daily. We are to reject those things. We are to run from those things. We are to put to death those things. But in his second epiphany, <clears throat> we will not suffer with the issue of lawlessness. Why? Because we will be redeemed, because Christ has redeemed us from that lawlessness by instituting his second epiphany. This is what most theologians call an already not yet. We possess this now but we will not fully possess it until our death or the return of Christ. So what is talking about here in this second epiphany are those, for those of us who are living, a reality that is coming in the future, but a reality we possess currently. Upon our death, we possess it fully. Upon the return of Christ, we will possess it fully. So we live in this, we have it, but not yet have it, stage in, the, in this in first epiphany. But in the second epiphany, Christ comes, his redemption is complete, from all lawless acts, we have been declared righteous. We stand before God, not based upon our merit not, merit, not based upon our grace, but upon the unmerited favor of God's grace, which brings salvation. To what? Purify. Now, who's doing the purifying? To purify for himself. So it's God who's doing the purifying. What? A people. So he is purifying a people for himself. Notice for this, for his own possession. Notice the phraseology. It doesn't say for those who possess Christ. It says for those who Christ possesses. He purifies for himself a people for his own. Why? Because he buys you. See, there's only two conclusions in the world in which we live. We are either slaves to sins or we are slaves to Christ. Being a slave to sin means that we are the ones that when the blessed return of Christ comes... Well, those who are not his go to hell. And those who have been bought by the precious blood of Christ are his. And when they have been bought by Christ, they have been bought by Christ. They are his possessions. Not the same as he becomes my possession. Who are zealous for his works. This understanding, go back to De Deuteronomy chapter 7. When God chooses Israel, when God chooses a people in the Old Testament for himself, he does not base that upon their merit. He makes it very clear in Deuteronomy chapter 7. I didn't choose you because you were great. I didn't choose you because you were powerful. I didn't choose you because you were great thinkers. I didn't choose you because you were obedient. I did not choose you based upon anything other than I loved you and set my affection upon you. I chose you, Israel, based upon nothing you did. Here in this passage, I purified these people, I bought these people because I wanted a people for my own. Same description. And now the result of that is that we are to be zealous for good works. Our lives as possessions of God should reflect the very nature of rejecting a worldly life, rejecting a a life of rebellion and embracing a life that is, as the text says, we'll go back one, controlled and upright, godly lives in this present age. A zealous people for his good work. And so the context of this part is not simply, uh, is basically two epiphanies. Christ comes, grace brings salvation to all, to train those who are his to then help us to reject ungodly lifestyles and behavior, to embrace godly lifestyles and behavior, to be a possession that is God's in the second epiphany. And we have this blessed hope because he paid for us here that when he returns, we look forward to this glorious day of God's return. And then he closes out with these words. Declare these things. Declare what things? Declare only back to verse 11? No. Only back to verse 1. Declare these things that accord with sound doctrine. Older men, older women. Younger men, younger women. Masters, slaves. Jew, Gentile. Grace bringing salvation. Training 
us to reject, to conform, to live in all that accords with sound doctrine. That's your context. That's your context for that passage. Then he also says, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Why does he say that? Because he closed out chapter 1 with that. The job of the elder is to rebuke those who are insubordinate, who are disrupting the body, and who are teaching bad theology. That's the role of the elder, to exhort and rebuke these things. So declare these things, use them to exhort the body, to encourage the body with, to have the body pressed on towards the mark, to tell the body to have hope for the second epiphany that is coming, and those who refuse, you are to rebuke them. And then he gives Titus the same uh, message that he gives to Timothy. Let no one disregard you. Let no one tell you you don't know what you're talking about. And that's the purpose of 2 Timothy. Or sorry, I keep saying 2 Timothy. And we're in Titus. I know we're in Titus. Forgive me. That is the purpose of Titus chapter 2. And that is the context of Titus chapter 2. Hey, listen, it's great to have you uh, come and join us uh, this morning as we've live streamed out. Um, and one of the things I'd like to leave you with is as we continue to go on in, in, in life with, with this pandemic that is going on, we have something that the non-believer doesn't have. We have the blessed hope of the second epiphany of Jesus Christ. We have that blessed hope, and then we also have an obligation to take that into a world and tell others about that second coming and about the, the fact that Christ has come. Salvation has been made available. Salvation is going to be known by folk, to, to folks who do not know who Christ is. And we have this obligation to take that message into the world. Why? Because if you do not have the salvation of Jesus Christ... You do not have the blessed hope of his second coming. What you do have is the certainty of death and destruction from that second coming. So I want to encourage you that even during this time of pandemic, that, that this is a great opportunity to share your faith with those who are worried about the future, who are concerned about the future hope that they have, who are worried about have just lost their job, who have worried about whether or not they're going to have the economy that's going on. We as Christians are to constantly be focusing upon the blessed hope that we should be telling every individual about the salvation that has been brought by Christ to every man, to every woman, to every child, to all types, kinds of people throughout the world. And we are to live our lives in such a way that we are constantly looking forward to the blessed hope. It's great to have you with us here in the live stream this morning, and I want to thank you for joining us.